Welcome to our first Lunch and Learn of 2022, facilitated by the Pacific Northwest Chapter of the International Erosion Control Association. We represent Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. I'm David Jenkins, president of the Northwest Chapter, Pacific Northwest Chapter. Before we start, I'd like to share a little bit about the IECA and our chapter. Um, you can join the IECA for as little as $25 a year if you're a student. If you're 35 or under, 115, you are a young professional. Uh, $65 a year, you're an old professional like me. And there's various uh, intermediate um, membership levels. The membership to the IECA gives you access to webinars, conferences, as well as opportunities for connecting with other professionals. Um, if you join the IECA, you'll automatically become a member of the Pacific Northwest chapter. Now I'd like to introduce to you Nathan Hardeback, our speaker today, uh, who will provide a construction stormwater regulatory update. Uh, he'll give a brief overview of the regulatory environment for federal projects, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana, with relation to construction stormwater management and we'll discuss current policy drivers and permit requirements that are in effect now and could be expected in the near future. Um, Nathan has over 20 years of experience in environmental consulting with an emphasis on BMPs, permitting services management related to industrial construction, municipal and commercial stormwater programs. His professional experience includes providing training, sampling, treatment design, SWIP development, BMP selection for public agencies, as well as working on behalf of private clients and industries on their management and BMP programs. Um, this Lunch and Learn will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel, uh, which is available through our uh, website. Let me go back here. And also, um, it qualifies for a 0.5 professional development hours, and I will post a certificate in the chat, as well as posting Nathan's resume for more information and uh, contact information. So one last thing. Um, oh, well, here we go. So here's our website, pnwciec.org, uh, and I'll just leave it at that. Please check it out. Uh, for information on future events, joining the association and uh, other items. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Nathan. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and post them in the chat and he will get to them uh, at the end of his presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dave, appreciate that. <clears throat> um, we'll get started here. Uh, like Dave said, I think what we want to do is essentially get through the content. And if you have questions, type them in the chat or at the end, we'll sort of have a an open mic uh, type of conversation to uh, to answer any questions. The as we discussed, these are kind of the goals of the presentation, but I, I want to go over the EPA and I, I have to start off with sort of a disclaimer. Um, I put in content based on the draft EPA as of last week and this morning, the uh, final EPA construction federal permit posted. So uh, the content in there is gonna be based on the draft uh, and not the final. I don't think there's huge differences between those two, but I just wanted to make that note. Uh, we're gonna talk about Montana, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. The, the goal is to give you some real high level overview of these programs, not uh, and identify some of the, the commonalities that you see as if you're a contractor and working in multiple locations, you know, what can you anticipate with a, a permitting program uh, going from state to state, but every program, just like every construction project has unique elements and uh, you need to know the nuances in the jurisdictions that you're working in to stay in compliance with your permit. We're, we're, we're gonna stay out of the weeds. One, cause you get lost in there. And uh, two, I have to also say, you know, these are based on the state requirements and what we're not talking about are things like 
uh, nuances and changes between the state regulatory agency and the DOT or state DOT or a local jurisdiction requirements because that's where things get very nuancy and we just don't frankly have the time or uh, you know I don't know if I have the bandwidth to cover all that so anyway uh, what's important to know is that every jurisdiction every state uh, every place that you go has different policy drivers and there are things about the locations that you're working in which may set precedent for different criteria. Uh, a lot of that is happening right now in relationship to water quality standards that states are evaluating the health of their receiving waters and they are identifying new pollutants of concern. I was giving another training yesterday and one of the speakers on there was talking about uh, PPD uh, coming off of tires and how that's going to essentially um, change a lot of our management decisions and, and policy making going forward. You know, uh, a lot of these water bodies that people live around or, or want to build around uh, are influenced by tourism. <clears throat> and those folks can, can uh, influence projects as well. Of course, there's different species, whether they be fish, frogs, or birds, uh, that can really influence our management decisions, our BMP selection. Obviously, there's differences in climate that can drive that, as well as what's really uh, an interesting discussion, if you've been involved in any of these, is really how much fish we eat uh, can also drive a lot of the policy making relationally to uh, how these permits are formed. So uh, just some very, you know, depending upon where you go, those policy drivers can change and there may be additional criteria from state to state or region to region uh, as a result of those. What are common elements to all state programs are number one, the, the threshold from a state standpoint is the one acre disturbance or a part of a larger common plan of development. Now, those statements, perpetuate through all the permits, but how people interpret the part or larger common plan of development sometimes has some nuance to it. Um, but those are essentially the baselines of what is required to be permitted at a state level. There's also a caveat in every state that if your construction activity has a high potential risk that there is that the state deems that there's a high risk you're going to need to have a permit whether you meet the acreage disturbance or not every state prohibits process water discharge things like concrete washout things like pressure washer work uh, things like even in a lot of cases uh, dewatering they are they have to have controls over them or they have to be managed separately then your stormwater discharge, just let's be real clear in our statement. These permits are managing stormwater discharge, that water that precipitates out of the air, runs across the surface of the ground and off the site. Other water sources are going to be encountered on your construction projects. When you're digging subgrade and dirty water fills up that hole, we're transferring the name of water from groundwater to surface water. When it rains on the hole, it's now stormwater. And if you're doing concrete work and you, you know, wash out the chute into that hole, now it's called process wastewater. So you, you did one activity, but you had four names of water that you had to deal with. So you got to make sure that you've got plans for those. Every state requires that you have a plan if you disturb an acre or more or a part of a larger common plan development. And that plan is the identification of what compliance means for that project. And to be in compliance and stay in compliance, every state requires that there's some type of monitoring to be done. And then uh, there's some record keeping aspect of it as well. The common path of permit coverage is, is the same in each state. Number one, you first have to prepare and preparing means you're gonna pay some money, you're gonna pay a permit fee, you're gonna build a plan. You're gonna then get coverage and getting coverage changes from state to state, but you are gonna get coverage. And, and sometimes you do that electronically, sometimes you do that through paper, sometimes you're doing it through the state agency, sometimes the state agency is defaulting to the local jurisdiction. 
then you're going to take action and that action is from what you prepared right so you've made the plan and you're going to implement that plan in the field and then at some point you don't want your name associated to the project anymore and so you are going to um, essentially uh, stabilize the site and you're going to need to get off of the project at that point. So let's talk specifically about the uh, federal construction general permit. Again, it just posted this week. Uh, there is a public webinar for it. I've, I've put website links here for you. Again, this will be posted on uh, the Northwest chapter IECA's website. So you can go back and grab these, but <clears throat> this is where this you can find this content. And there is a free public webinar uh, being hosted February 24th. Uh, to go over the new content there. So you just need to sign up and register for that if you wanna do it. When we're talking about EPA permit coverage, there's not a lot of coverage of, th there's actually really only three states in the nation still that have direct EPA coverage and that's New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and New Mexico. Idaho just took primacy of their permit a couple years ago and they are transferring into the IPDS program, which we'll talk about before. But if you work on federal facilities within the states or you're working in a national park, that's where this EPA coverage may uh, take over or you may, they may actually default to the state-based permit in those applications as well. So the, I'm sorry, these say proposed permit elements. I did not have a chance to change the slides as of learning it happened this morning. Hoping you're not seeing that window. I'm gonna to try to close that. That uh, anyway, let's see if that one. Here we go. See if that closes that window for you. Okay, so uh, the EPA proposed permit elements uh, really have to do with spill control and spill management on projects. There's some new criteria set there uh, for how much material you're bringing on the piece of property requires certain types of containment or uh, distance from your discharge that may go to a receiving water. So uh, if you're, you're 55 gallons or more, you have to have things in secondary containment, undercover located at least 50 feet away from any of your uh, stormwater drainage coming off of your piece of property there. There's also this requirement, and uh, I'm sorry, again, I don't know what the final is. I'll have to read that, but um, the dewatering criteria that the EPA is discussing has to do with if you're going to dewater on your piece of property, there are going to be daily inspections that you have to demonstrate no visible turbidity or sheen from the dewatering practice at the BMP the dewater bag, whatever tank you're putting in there is discharging no visible turbidity or sheen. And you've got to uh, demonstrate that with photographic proof. Uh, I'll, I'll say this, that the federal permit has really started to lean on photography uh, as being one of their inspection elements uh, going forward here. That has some real pluses and minuses as to, uh, you know, uh, we might have to have a whole section in these trainings about how to take a good picture uh, to go forward here. There are also potential discussions on the numeric limits of the properties and those actually coming up with a discharge standard for those piece of properties moving forward if you're discharging to sensitive receiving water. So whereas things have, have previously been visible, visible indicators or things like that, there's some discussion about coming up with an NTU limit. They've also defined uh, discharge event triggers that, that trigger the inspections. And those discharge event triggers are quarter inch rain events or snow melt of uh, three, point, three and a quarter inches of accumulated snow. And that's gonna have to be done by a qualified inspector. And this is the first, I think, I think, a federal certification program that the EPA has released. And just like a lot of states have different uh, certification programs, the actual EPA is going to create a certification program uh, that's gonna be about, they're talking about an eight hour course 
that you are going to have to be certified to be a qualified inspector to operate on a federal construction general permit program uh, uh, project. And that there is a requirement that if your BMPs need some type of maintenance, that that maintenance is completed within 24 hours of the inspection identifying that it needed to happen there. All right, so I, I changed my mind. I am gonna answer questions specific to each state. So I'm seeing one here. Um, okay. That's not a question, it's just a comment. So I'll, I'll keep going. If you have questions specific to any of these state specific ones, I will check after each um, state to see if you've got any questions related to that. The Montana permit, the Montana permit MTR 100,000. This is the current permit expires the end of this year. Uh, there's discussion about the draft being made available uh, summer to fall of this next year. I've heard some, I've been on a couple of webinars about uh, proposed changes. Again, not huge changes, uh, more kind of uh, language-based or, or um, focused at trying to clarify some of the definitions that are within it, but not huge uh, structural changes to it moving forward here. What's a little bit different about their permit is that if you get into a sizable dewatering project, you may also have to have a dewatering permit. So, and there's, there's not really a huge bright line as to the quantity. It's sort of when you have to take on math and dewatering wells and things like that, you may actually have to pull a separate dewatering permit for that construction activity along with your MTR uh, 100,000 uh, to move forward on that project. There's also a, a desire by Montana DEQ, I don't know if that's the right term, but to really make sure that MS4s and counties have influence over management of construction activity within their jurisdictions. And so there's, there's this opening in the current permit for you to make sure that you're in communication with the local jurisdiction about your construction activity to make sure that their program, the local program is, that your activity is meeting their requirements as well. There's also a requirement in this in their permit that requires signage of your SWIP. And this sign here that's in this picture isn't a compliant sign in Montana, but you, you are going to have a SWIP board with your information posted to the general public and having uh, prescribed text on that sign to go forward. So the biggest issue is so much isn't about the information there. Oftentimes it's keeping the sign up in a high wind environment. So uh, that's been a challenge for them as well. Uh, the proposed monitoring for the uh, program in Montana <clears throat> really is focused on BMPs. And it's about making sure that the BMPs are performing as they're designed. Now, how Montana deals with things a little bit different than other states is that you, the, the toolbox, if you will, of BMPs is sort of open you can use whatever it is that you want, but you have to, you have to uh, supply the design specifications for the BMPs that you're implementing along with your uh, SWIP. There is no current uh, discussion for required sampling of discharge. It's all visible uh, and there's no discharge, discharge standard at this point, other that you're other than you're not um, causing violations of the state water quality standards. And I'll also say in Montana, right, a lot of, in other, other places that we're gonna talk about as well, a lot of the protection isn't so much about receiving water, sur receiving surface waters, I should say, creeks and streams and lakes. It's more about protecting the aquifer and making sure that when water goes down dry wells and things like that, that one, it's not impacting the dry well function, 
uh, but two, it's not contaminating the groundwater source, which is a major drinking water um, supply for, for that region. You are required to do inspections and you have, <clears throat> those inspections are required to be done by a uh, SWIP preparer or administrator that they have taken uh, a two day certification class that re requires a field component. And that certified person has the option of inspecting based on two frequencies. One, you're either inspecting once a week, uh, every seven calendar days. Okay, I gotta be careful about saying once a week because that seven days triggers after your last inspection. So, um, <clears throat> you know, that day can change throughout the week. Or you can go to biweekly, but if you're gonna go to biweekly every two weeks or every 14 calendar days, you are, measuring rainfall uh, to demonstrate that you're going to be out there after a quarter inch rain event within 24 hours. So you, you may have multiple inspections within that 14 calendar days, uh, but you're using a rainfall trigger to, to uh, initiate an inspection. What's unique about Montana uh, in their in, in getting a, a permit there is, is you got to consider sage grouse in a lot of areas. And there's actually a, a consultation that you need to go through with their, uh, the sage grouse program about where you're building and are you near lecking areas or flight paths of the sage grouse and things like that. So uh, it's kind of a unique species that you got to work around. And the MS4 permits, the city or county permits can have um, influence over your management on your piece of property. All right, I'm just checking the chat here. Nobody's chatted, so we're good. Idaho, let's talk about Idaho real quick. Idaho is got their new program, the IPDES program. Uh, all permits in the country operate under the NPDES program, the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. Idaho's made their own. It's the Idaho Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. And the construction general permit is the IDR 100,000. We like those numbers. Uh, and it is effective on February 10th of this year. So we are going to start working on the new IPDES program in Idaho, not uh, relying previously like they did on the federal construction general permit. There is <clears throat> in Appendix C, and this is also with federal programs, but this is sort of to our region, it's sort of a, a newer discussion, if you will. And it, it sort of goes into this high risk category that I talked about before, but there's some discussion about eligibility of actually doing construction activities related to your proximity to endangered or in threatened species. And it's not that you can't do the project, but you may have other conditional elements, BMP practices that you have to implement when working near those species. So um, that's a, an additional criteria that you've got to think about the Snake River, the uh, Coeur d'Alene area, those type of areas can potentially have what I would say is additional permitting considerations that need to go in there um, to get these projects started. I'll also say that PCBs, and again, I haven't read the federal permit, but this was a discussion in about 2019 with the feds about actually making PCB a, a, a metric that was gonna be something that people had to measure in their discharge. PCBs is an emerging contaminant of concern. It's in a lot of yellow paint on the side of the road. It's in a lot of joint glue. And the challenge is, is that there are some water bodies, especially around the Coeur d'Alene area, Spokane River specifically, that are limited, that they have a health issue for PCBs. And so there's some discussion in the IPDES about if you're doing demolition on the project to do reconstruction, that you're going to have to put in uh, some additional PCB controls to manage the demolition prior to the reconstruction uh, and monitor for potentially PCBs going forward. The monitoring for 
the IPDS CGP is if you're discharging direct to or receiving water that you've got some NTUs to look for. Uh, NTUs being the measurement of turbidity. I hope everybody's familiar with that term and I don't need to explain that, but um, you've got some instantaneous monitoring upstream and downstream of your discharge points if you're direct discharging to a receiving water and you're gonna do that daily. The, the interesting thing about the IPDS program and their monitoring is it's not all points of discharge, it's your most representative point of discharge, which Washington and Oregon, they sort of had those permit requirements about 15 years ago. They're being um, now put into the Idaho permit as well. And you're gonna use a turbidimeter and you're gonna to need to keep that calibration log as part of your record keeping going forward. So this is now specifically for for projects that have direct discharge to a surface water that they are discharging to. So I wanna make sure that that's clear. It's not necessarily a, a project that's inland and, and doesn't have any receiving waters around it. It's, it's for direct discharge to receiving waters upstream, downstream uh, criteria. You have inspection requirements and those inspection requirements are once every seven days, or you can go to the 14 calendar days. Again, very similar to Montana, uh, where you can choose if you're gonna do the seven, to, seven day one, or if you're gonna do every 14 days and be triggered by rainfall. Uh, and the inspector doing those inspections and sampling has to be certified. And you can take the federal construction general permit certification, when that goes uh, up onto the website, you'll be able to certify it under there, or you can take another course that, uh, there, you know, there could be a SISEC or a SESWI or a CSTOL or all these other acronyms that are out there. You can take one of those that are gonna be equivalent. I, I guess my caution, when I, when I say those things, a lot of, there are a lot of big acronyms for training programs that are out there and, and you know, my only concern is, is that if you're in a state specific train, you know, you're trying to do something in a state permit, but you're taking either a federal training or you're taking a Washington training to do that, you're not necessarily listening to the criteria in that state. So what's important is that you're going to have to do your own homework. You really need to read the permit. Nobody's going to stand up in front of you for eight, 16, 14 hours, whatever that training is, and talk about that state specific training if these states are relying on other people's certifications uh, to meet their criteria. So it's, it, you need to be mindful about that. Uh, what I think is unique about their permit is they bring in this concept of the stormwater team, all right, and that there's somebody who's certified to do the monitoring and do the inspections, but they are sort of leading a team of people that are, are making sure that the project stays in compliance with the permit. And that stormwater team have specific, there are specific people that are identified that need to be on the team, but it's also talking to your, your subcontractors or other service providers that come onto your piece of property, that they need to be communicated about what the plan is for this piece of property. What, what's the SWIP say? How are we gonna make sure that uh, what you do as an activity on this piece of property doesn't influence my compliance on this site as the, uh, as the permittee? So I think this stormwater team concept is an interesting one that's um, starting to be built out and who who's on the team. I think some challenges, right, if, as you change subcontractors, that's potentially a lot of um, education that you got to do there of people that are coming on your piece of property for different reasons. All right, I see a couple of uh, questions in the chat window. Do they all recognize CP, CPESC as equal? I believe that is true. Um, yes, that that would be an equivalent program the CPESC, uh, Washington, no. I'm not sure what that means, but um, Washington does recognize CPESC as uh, equivalent to a CECL in that state. We'll get to that point in a minute. Okay, uh, Oregon, the 1200C and 1200CN permits, that's the name of their permit there. 
uh, and it will expire December 20 of 25. They have in, implemented the new online reporting system. So when you go do work in Oregon, it is uh, they're now asking for electronic applications. You are no longer submitting paper and it's through this YODO program, the Your DEQ Online. And there's this, there's some new titles, if you will, that the person applying for the permit needs to be a responsible person. Responsible person means the person that can write a check to change behavior or can apply the permit to have control over the piece of property. And then they are going to become potentially the permit registrant. So you, you kind of migrate from being the responsible permit to the permit registrant once you are issued the permit. And then it, these, it's, it's kind of a nuancy thing, but the these permits are, you know, who's ultimately going to jail, who's ultimately getting in trouble. It, it's the owner operator. You've heard that term before. Oregon's using some new definitions to sort of and capture that, that concept. Oregon also has something similar to Montana, but they actually have a formal program for it called the LUX, the Land Use Compatibility Statement. And that means when you do a project within a local jurisdiction, you have to actually fill out a form of a LUX form to demonstrate that your management system is going to be in compliance with local drainage codes. And so as you're building things or plumbing pipes to connect to the city MS4 system, that you're doing it in such a way that the, uh, the city, you're, you're doing it in compliance with that city program. Their permit is also <clears throat> broken out into what they call schedules, uh, you know, other, a lot of other uh, permits call them appendices or whatever, but they call them schedules going forward. Their definition of a SWIP is not a SWIP, it's an ESCP, it's an erosion sediment control plan. So those, it's just nuance in, in uh, acronyms. There is also a requirement that they have for projects that are 20 plus acres that an erosion sediment control plan must be completed by an Oregon licensed uh, PE uh, or a, or a CPESC law or a CPESC. Uh, so that those folks, you need to have somebody that's got some formalized training to put those in. Now I'm gonna also caveat that with, if you are building a retention pond that has, I can't remember what their threshold is. It's like, I can't remember what their threshold is for, for uh, certain types of volume, those ponds have to be engineered. So um, you have to have a licensed engineer do that for you. Their appendix A is a new thing this year. It's called the emergency management plan, which we'll talk about in a second. And they also have an appendix B, which is Oregon's version of the buffer zone requirement for federal construction general permit. So they have two appendices and these appendices, I was on a, again on doing another one yesterday and uh, heard from the Oregon folks down there. And he said that the, I guess the, the appendix A has gone pretty smoothly, uh, but the appendix B is, is sort of a confusion, point of confusion for some folks uh, moving forward here in Oregon. The requirement for monitoring on construction activity in Oregon is no visible turbidity. Okay, that's the benchmark. That is the compliance standard that any discharge point coming off of that piece of property, you can you you must not have any visible turbidity or sheen discharging off the piece of property. There's not a numeric standard. There, there's a numeric standard, but it's a water quality standard if you're discharging to a receiving water of no more than 10% to the, uh, no more 10% cumulative increase to the background. Okay, cumulative being a period of time, but uh, most, projects or all projects, the visual metric of turbidity is, is the criteria. There are also some very specific BMP performance standards that they have for different um, BMPs that are on site. They have criteria set in place for 
when maintenance activity needs to happen. Um, covering of, of vegetation, a third of the above ground said fence, if it's got sediment uh, built up that high, you need to maintain it. Uh, two inches of freeboard for your straw waddle or bio bag, you know, um, catch basin inserts that are half full, those type of criteria, those, those become inspection metrics that inspectors are out trying to look for. And if they show up on a site and your catch basin insert is more than 50% full, that is a basically a, a finable activity or a, a violation of the permit. So they have some very specific criteria set forth in their BMPs. The inspection criteria for Oregon under the 1200C is that you are one of these certified, uh, you have one of these certifications on the bottom here uh, as one of your requirements. I will say out of all of that list, there is only one certification program that specifically talks about the Oregon criteria and that's the Rogue Valley Sewer Services Erosion Sediment Patrol Certification. It is specific to Jackson County uh, and Jackson County criteria but all of these other certifications, you'll go and you'll get the basic principles of stormwater management, but there is not a specific section dedicated to uh, the Oregon 1200C. So you're gonna have to learn that on your own, or in some cases, there are some certifiers that do the Washington CECIL who basically have an extra credit section to talk about the 1200C permit. The Inspectors for those pieces of property have to inspect on the initial date of uh, moving forward. There's a requirement, so you have to have that piece of paper. Every 14 calendar days or every day that there is storm water discharging off the piece of property, okay, within 24 hours. So you, you could essentially, in a lot of places in Oregon, be inspecting on a daily basis and have an inspection log on a daily basis. So it's really important that. Uh, those frequencies there, there's a lot of monitoring expectation in Oregon. Now what's unique to the Oregon program is that the Oregon DEQ might not be your permitting authority. And depending upon where you work, and there's a list of those that are identified over here to the right, depending upon what jurisdiction you're in, and if they have an approved program and, and they these cities or these entities have signed to the to the Oregon DEQ that they're going to be the enforcement and uh, permitting authority within their jurisdictions for certain size projects or that type of thing. Anyway, your your agent or your your inspection folks may not be a state person; it may be a city person, and they may have different criteria. In fact, uh, the Clean Water Services and and uh, Eugene have very specific criteria that you have to meet. They have different BMPs that they like or don't like, and th there'll be requirements based on where you go within that state to get your permit from those folks. What's also pretty interesting and unique about, it's not so unique, but it, it's emphasized, I should say, is that when you go through the permitting process in Oregon, whether it's a 1200C or a 1200CN with a local authority, you're, if you have a multi-year or a multi-phased project, you either have to permit all of those phases all at the same time, or you have to phase each, you have to permit each phase independently. And there are pluses and minuses to both. It, frankly, in a lot of cases, especially multi-year or multi-year, multi multi-phase projects, you might not be able to permit all at once because you don't even know who the players are yet. You don't even know who the, the, the contractor is yet because it hasn't gone out to bid. So you may have to independently do each one of those. Now, if you could do it all at once, you could rely on the same erosion sediment control plan from start to finish but you're gonna to have to, it's gonna be very complicated from a paperwork standpoint to do that. So um, what was happening is that folks had multiple phased projects and they were stockpiling or they were 
uh, utilizing a, a phase that wasn't yet actively being worked on and it was causing erosion issues on a non-permitted piece of property uh, and it was causing some angst. So that it became a very, this is a, it's a challenging component of permitting in Oregon at this point. The emergency management plan, which is appendix A of the 1200C has to do with, if you're working on a project of known contaminated soil, you're gonna fill this out. You're also gonna fill this out if you plan to use some type of active chemical treatment system. Uh, you, if you're going to a chitosin enhanced sample tracing system or an electrocoagulation system, you're, you're going to need to submit an additional emergency management plan for the project going forward. What isn't clear as of yesterday's discussion is what happens if you discover contaminants that you didn't previously know were there, you're likely going to have to go through this plan as well. Now, Currently, there's one person at DEQ that has to evaluate this plan. So um, we are potentially going to get to a point where the limiting factor is that that one person doesn't have enough bandwidth to see all these plans that come through. So this is, again, we want to have enough planning up front or enough understanding to get all the paperwork going like it needs to in Oregon. They also use a different term for BMPs. Everybody's kind of got their own nuance about terms and Oregon's term for, for how BMPs, I guess not specifically the BMP, but goals and objectives utilizing BMPs for the project. They call them T-bells and you may have heard this in federal permits, but they, they put these right out front called technology-based effluent limits. And the goals are like you know, how are you going to cover? How often are you going to cover? You know, how are you going to manage your construction entrance? It doesn't say I'm going to use a, a you know, a FODs unit or I'm going to use uh, crushed rock as my wheel entrance as a BMP. It just says, what are, you, what are your objectives of this BMP category or this focus of the project in terms of putting BMPs in place? Yeah, so there's a whole bunch of conversation here in the permit about when utilizing um, st soil stabilizers, you know, lime kiln, dust, fly ash stabilizers, that you're going to have to make sure that the runoff from those areas where the stabilizers are used are trapped first by an impoundment, whether that be a sediment basin, whether that be tanks and that you're gonna to have to do pH monitoring before that project discharges. And here's the real challenge is that the pH number, you know, then you ask me, okay, so I've got fly ash stabilizer that's going to a detention pond, what's the pH need to be? Well, the pH is gonna change based on where your project is because the pH is determined by the receiving water. And if you guys know anything about pH, pH is a logarithmic scale. And the difference between 7.5 and 7.4 is a difference in change. You know, right? the difference between seven and eight is 10 times, right? So when we're trying to meet a benchmark of measurable change of a receiving water, that receiving water pH can change seasonally, daily, hourly, and it's gonna be a real interesting discussion about what is this pH benchmark that I'm trying to achieve so I can let this water go. Uh, it's a, I'm not sure that it's totally clear how this is, this is going to be uh, implemented going forward. I know it's gonna be somewhere between 6.5 and 8.5 that is gonna be allowable, but if it's based on the receiving water, this can create some real nuance based on your projects there. All right, let me get into the chat real quick. Uh, okay, I'm scrolling back here. The Department Idaho of Transportation has its own training requirements for projects to serve one acre or more and only accept that training at this time. Yes, that is exactly correct. Uh, what is the name of that training? Okay, it's already down here, the Water Pollution Control Manager. Okay, and they are not allowed, good. And they're not allowing CPESC, okay, good. Uh, it's important that your LUX discusses all the plan phases. Good, because you can no longer add future fit. Yes, correct. That is exactly right. So um, 
you, the, the, in, the, the Lux is the Oregon one now that you need to sort of know all of your planning. You can't just, you can't just keep adding on in Oregon. You can't just keep adding on to your existing permit. If your phase development moves to the next phase, you can't just reference the old permit number. You actually have to go through the whole process again, reissue a Lux, reissue your NOI, your notice of intent, and go through the process again of application of the next phase. All right, good job. Let's talk about Washington. Uh, again, Washington and Oregon are sort of on a similar scale. Just, I, I guess I'm assuming that folks know this, but permits last for five years. So every time a, a state issues a permit, the rules that are issued um, last for five years and then they, they redefine the rules. And, and Washington and Oregon are on a very similar cycle, if you will, in terms of uh, when their permits reissue. So we are, we are on this permit in Washington state. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. Let me get back. Washington, to get a permit, requires that you have a, what's called a SAW account, Secure Access Washington account. It's the same platform that we submit uh, to the Department of Revenue, to the Department of Licensing, and you are submitting your notice of intent for your construction activity under your account to the Department of Ecology through this portal, which has some folks don't necessarily that have never done this before don't always know how to set up an account or to get a signature account with the Department of Ecology. It can create some challenges in terms of reporting. Uh, if, if the person that's signing up or permitting for the site doesn't give what's called authorization to the CECL, the, the inspector, which we'll talk about in a minute, to do the inspection on their behalf, that CECL tries to report things and the system won't let them because it doesn't, um, it doesn't recognize that that permission has been granted. I'll also say in Washington, you have to, you, you have, to have more run up. You, you have to give ecology more time to evaluate your, your plan. Uh, there's a 60 day requirement. So, so you, you know, if you, if your project is supposed to start in 45 days, you should have submitted your NOI to the Department of Ecology 15 days ago. Other states, it's around 30. Uh, 30 days is generally the standard. Uh, Oregon sort of doesn't, it's 30 days as a requirement, but they can sort of push you out further if they don't uh, get to you in time. And what's interesting about the Washington CG, CSGP is that they started bringing in this concept of migrating into forest practice as, as part of the permit requirement, as part of the phasing of the project. So what has happened historically is as the property gets, you know, the trees are getting cut down so the grading contractor can come in, dirt's being torn up and, and things like that. And regulators have gone in and say, well, where's your SWIP? And the guy with the chainsaw says, what's a SWIP, right? And, and they, don't, they don't know, that's not, they're under civic cultural practices and they don't have this same criteria that's been built in there. This permit specifically brings nexus to that activity and the civic cultural practices that are happening um, as part of the management that has to happen on the piece of property for BMPs, that the BMPs need to be in when that, activity, that clearing and grading activity, and the trees being cut down starts to happen. So it's a, it's an interesting motivation of the permit to try to, to reach into the, uh, into the civic cultural practices moving forward here. There is a NTU value, okay, that is required of projects in Washington state. If you have a permit, the goal and objective of all the discharge of your water coming off your property is 25 NTU, less than 25 NTU and under 8.5 in pH. So you're monitoring, you're monitoring your NTUs. You're also doing significant concrete work, which we don't have time to go into, but it's a, 
If you're using a lot of concrete on your piece of property, you're also taking pH measurements. If you're, the goal is to be under 25 NTU. Now, if between 25 NTU and 249 NTU, you get to apply what's called adaptive management. You get to make decisions for yourself. You get to choose the tools. You get to uh, make decisions how you're going to keep your project in compliance with the permit. As soon as you hit 250 or higher in any of your discharge points, or you're over a pH of 8.5 at any of your discharge points, you have to call Ecology within 24 hours and communicate to them that they need to come out and help you and support you moving forward. You are also in Washington reporting all of this information on your SAW account. So it goes in on an electronic discharge monitoring report and it goes in monthly. And that information is available. We could get on here and we could call up any construction activity that's happening in the state of Washington right now to see how that they are, they are performing on their job site. So there is, this is where the world is going, by the way, I'm just letting you know, uh, Washington has this, Oregon's got the Yodo program now. Um, EPA has the ECHO program. Uh, it's likely that that's going to make its way into the construction general permit at some point. Um, but there are what a lot of these regulatory agencies are doing is moving to this electronic reporting. The feds are actually saying you should also report it with pictures, um, which again has some interesting potential to it as well. So. Uh, we're just seeing this migration of going from, from paper to, to electronic. Inspections are required to be done by a CECL. Uh, they're once a week and within 24 hours of discharge. The CECL is required, it's, the CECL is a BMP. Uh, you, it's BMP C160 out of the Western Washington Stormwater Management Manual in volume two. And you can look at the criteria that's set there, but it's a basically a two-day program and you must be certified and your certification lasts for three years to do that. Uh, Washington has some very defined BMP resources uh, that are out there that are uh, the stormwater management manuals, which your, your SWIPs need to uh, reference. And if those BMPs, you want to use something that's outside of those manuals, you have to identify what is demonstrably equivalent to, to get that done. And there's a new term in the Washington permit called construction support activity that these offsite areas that you're using for staging or parking, they are wrapped up in your inspection. And if you have discharge off of those offsite parking areas, that it is also having to be measured for turbidity and pH, just like the main construction project. I'll also say this, in the world of stormwater treatment and using flocculants, there's no more, you know, this state is pretty prescriptive in how that is applied. You must be a treatment tech, treatment tech to apply chemistry in the state of Washington, which is another eight hour certification course. There's some prescribed BMPs uh, that you have to follow in terms of protocol as you do that as well. So. Um, very, very much defined in this state. Just as in summary, what, what we don't agree on across the board is, is what defines background of a receiving water? How far away does a receiving water have to be to define that background? I'll say that Montana and Idaho are very much like if you stand in it and you can see discharge, that's direct discharge. In Oregon and Washington, they are much more liberal about how far that receiving water is a way that can influence the project. We don't agree on what the metric needs to be in discharge. Is it a visual metric? Is it a sample that you're taking with a turbidimeter? Uh, are they benchmarks? Are they limits? Are they water quality standards? Uh, we, don't, we don't agree on the inspection trigger. Uh, some are driven by size thresholds of rain events. Some are based on any occurrence of discharge. We don't agree on the use of flocculants. Uh, we certainly don't agree on definition of terms and, and we don't agree at that stormwater is one word. Uh, what we do agree on is that turbidity is the metric 
uh, whether that's a visual or in a sample jar. Uh, we agree that every project needs perimeter controls. Now we don't always agree on what those perimeter controls need to be or how those perimeter controls are installed appropriately. Uh, that concrete management is something that everybody needs to do. That concrete washout has to be defined and contained and managed separately than your stormwater. That the SWIP or the erosion sediment control plan that you write and the site map of where you're putting in your BMPs is the definition of compliance for that project and that adaptive management is critical. All right, we did it, everybody. I ran a little bit long, I apologize. Um, let me go through here. This is being recorded. I can be reached. You can observe in Paris. Yep, good. Dave's putting links up there for more information. Mountain time, good. No, do Washington and Oregon have separate CECL programs? No, Oregon has adopted the Washington CECL. So I'm a CECL instructor and I have to go down to Oregon and teach Oregon people Washington permit requirements. Um, now, I in my program, I everybody has a working lunch so I can tell them about the 1200C, but um, you, you, you have to teach the Washington content in Oregon. Yes, active treat, when you use chemistry in Washington state, it must be done by a treatment tech. The only passive application of chemical treatment is generally in the pre-treatment form and there has to be a finish of going through a, a filtration process and residual chemistry test. The passive treatment door has opened in both Washington and Oregon, so has the um, active treatment in both states. There's a whole history lesson there, but um, it's really about checking for residual chemistry and making sure that it's meeting performance standards both in both applications. All right, any other questions or Dave, do you wanna take over? Uh, yeah, thank you so much for that, Nathan. That was excellent. I appreciate you taking the time. Um, if anybody has further questions they think of after, like I always do, uh, go ahead and contact Nathan directly, or you can contact um, me through the email address I posted in the chat, um, and I will pass the information on. Again, this has been recorded and is going to be posted on our YouTube channel, which can be accessed through the chapter webpage. Link is also in the chat. So uh, if anybody has anything else, we can address it now. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and close shop. All right, thank you, everybody.